Good morning, church. It's so good to be here with you online. Um, hey, we love you. We miss you. Um, it's so good, and it was such a joy to pray with uh, many of you who came yesterday to our prayer gathering. We want to be and we desire to be a church that seeks after God's presence, and, and we did that yesterday together as a community, and it was a wonderful time just praying together. So thank you for coming out to the, uh, for those of you who did. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Lance. I'm one of the pastors here at Communion, and we would love to connect with you. You have an opportunity to do that if you go to communion.today and hit the I am new here button, and you can fill out, just give us your email and some information. We'd love to contact you, find ways to pray and serve you in this season. And we've got a couple of things coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks that are can also be found at communion.today. The first is... Uh, we ha are, as a church, partnering with Samaritan's Purse in their endeavor that's called Operation Christmas Child. Um, what Operation Christmas Child is, is uh, there's these shoe boxes that we fill with goodies um, that are sent around the world uh, attached to a message of the gospel and Jesus' kingdom. Um, if you want to participate with us, there's two ways to do that. First, you can come down to our office at Balboa and grab a couple boxes, as many as you would like to fill. Um, there's instructions at SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC on certain gift items and ideas that you can do. Um, or you can do it online. If you go to that same website, you can uh, fill a shoebox from the comfort of your couch with your computer or your phone. Um, this is just a great way for us as a church to love and serve children across the globe who aren't, um, don't get the benefit of Christmas gifts like we do in the U.S. So we'd love for you to partner and join us in that endeavor. You can drop those boxes off here back at the, at the church office um, but, uh, anytime before November 22nd. Uh, the other thing is, is we are uh, going to be um, participating, uh, and I just blink a little bit, was our next slide. Uh, this is like the most important thing and I totally blinked. What's wrong with me? Yeah, uh, so we are moving to some in-person Sunday gatherings uh, through uh, for four weeks in November. If you are on our email list, you would have got um, the full details, um, but we are excited to begin moving slowly to this uh, and are, are, are inviting you to sign up and join us um, it's November 1st Sunday, the first Sunday in November. And our goal is to, um, to pray, to examine and explore certain ways that we can enjoy each other's, uh, 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 enjoy one another on Sundays again. We are in a little bit of a unique situation. We are undergoing an exciting and a, a pretty big building project uh, at our building, renovating some of the sanctuary and some other of the rooms. Our original plan was to meet at Marston Middle School while all this was going on, but the pandemic obviously throws a wrench in our plans. And so we are going to maneuver a little bit and host small groups here at, at, in the fellowship hall. So if you would like to join us on Sunday, you can go sign up at communion.today. There are limited seats. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use these four weeks to explore and see how it goes. And our hope is to begin permanently meeting together on Sundays. And when our sanctuary is done, let alone having a beautiful and sacred space to meet on Sundays, but we will be uh, able to meet uh, in larger groups as, a, as that room will be able to accommodate us. So, church, we love you. We want to see you here. Uh, go sign up in November for November 1st, and we'd love to get you out here on a Sunday worshiping in person again. Our social distancing and certain guidelines will be in place to ensure everyone's safety. And you can see our full regathering plan at communion.today if you scroll down to the resources tab. Church, that's all I've got. Um, we'd love for you to put away any of the distractions that you may have. Put away your phones. Um, enter in. Prepare your hearts as we worship to the Lord through music. And Allison is going to read a scripture from Psalm 63 to get us going. Good morning, church. Uh, Psalm 61, verses 1 through 5. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my lap my mouth will praise you. Gathered in your name, calling out to 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul describes the Christian life that we live here on earth kind of like running a race. No, it's not that we're all competing against each other to win. It's the fact that running a race requires some diligence, uh, some hard work, some training. And so the race that we run is the race of faith. And Paul says that it requires perseverance and discipline and hard work to run this race of faith, keeping our eyes totally fixed on the prize, Jesus Christ, until we finish the race, that is, until God takes us home to heaven. Now, running a race, you can expect to encounter all kinds of obstacles. And we can see that in this next video that we'll show you. This hill taking a toll on a couple runners trying to finish those final 20 yards. Wow. Yeah, you can see what, what a tremendous show of sportsmanship as you've got an athlete who can't quite make it and they've got a team a, a girl from another team trying to help her to the finish line so she can finish the race. That's what, now that's what the sport one is all well. about. Oh, my goodness. This is just incredible. The sportsmanship, phenomenal as you see those final yards there. As you see Clemson and Louisville helping the Boston College runner. That's Tate and Pease. And the Boston College runner can't even lift her legs right now. She'll try to cross the finish line. What a shot right here at Lakeman Soccer Park in Cary. But you sacrifice your own position wow. to help another athlete finish what they started. And that, that's a true story. Now, that's a great story of good sportsmanship, isn't it? But I want you to picture in your mind's eye that girl from Boston College who had dropped to her knees, struggling to finish the race. She just couldn't make it on her own. That depicts somebody in the body of Christ, perhaps you or me, who is struggling in our race of faith. In fact, uh, we have a difficult time even thinking about going on. We, we face discouragement or despair, perhaps financial pressures, relationship issues, all kinds of things. Even sin can weigh us down, drag us down to the ground, and we can't finish the race well. Now I want you to think about, in your mind, those two girls that came up alongside of her, and they lifted her up and, and basically carried her, shared the load as they made their way to the finish line. That depicts you and me as brothers and sisters coming alongside another brother and sister and lifting them up, encouraging them, giving them hope, helping them to finish the race well. Perhaps if it's sin, correcting or exhorting them so they can finish the race well. This is a beautiful picture that God gives us in the body of Christ how we are to work together to help one another, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus to finish the race well, bearing one another's burdens. I think the Life Application Study Bible says it best. It says we should never think that we are totally independent and don't need help from others, or think that we are excused from helping others because we are too important. The body of Christ, that is us, the church, functions only when the members together work for the common good. Do you know someone who needs help? Does a Christian brother or sister need correction? Then humbly and gently reach out, offering to lift that person's load. That is who we are as the body of believers, the family of God, helping one another finish the race well and sharing the load.
Heavenly Father, we just praise your holy name. God, I pray uh, right here and right now, wherever we are, that we would just put away distractions, God. Uh, you desire and you deserve our full attention. So, God, we put away our distractions. Uh, we turn our gaze towards you, God. We are, um, we are listening um, to what you have to say to us this morning. So, God, I pray that you would continue to uh, just draw near to us this service, God, that you would meet us here and now wherever we are. Um, and, God, our full attention uh, is on you because that's what you deserve, God. You are so holy. We praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. Again, church, it's good to be here with you online. If you have a Bible, once you grab it, um, turn to Galatians chapter 6. We're continuing on our series titled One Another. There are these imperatives in scriptures or these commands, um, just about a hundred of them that we find in scripture that use this word one another uh, in the Greek. And this gives us an idea, a picture of what a beautiful community looks like. And in the same turn, we want to embody these commands, we want to embody this way of life so that our community can once again or can begin to grow on these foundations to become a beautiful community. So this week we're looking at this idea of bearing our burdens with one another. That's found in Galatians chapter 6. Um, this Obviously this season has been a challenge and so I think if you can learn to laugh or find things that are enjoyable in this season, hold on to those things, right? I think one of the more fun things to do is to look at the crazy headlines that keep coming out, especially with just the culture we live in, the, the politics that are going on, and just the bickering and fighting that's happening in the world. It kind of just makes me laugh a little bit about how ridiculous certain people can be. Uh, one of those things I saw this last week was this article on the Avengers. I don't know if anyone has seen this, but um, one of the actors who was a part of the Avengers um, wasn't participating in a, a political rally or a political um, meeting of some sort because he didn't agree with some of the things that that political party stood for. And the Internet just had their heyday with this person. I remember Chris Pratt. Um, Google it. It's, it's a good laugh. You'll enjoy it for a few minutes. But um, basically, people attacked this person because they, he didn't agree with certain held views within our culture. Um, if you've been paying attention, we have this, this stream of thought called, called woke culture, or these people that have, uh, above all of us, have come to the truth and knowledge of reality that many of us don't have. Um, but this woke culture has led to something called cancel culture. And basically, if, if you don't agree with this mainstream cultural thought, then you're canceled or you're uh, kind of excommunicated from the public square. Um, what's really interesting, though, is, is what this cancel culture says implicitly about those who use it or wield the power of canceling people in our public square. What cancel culture says is, if you disagree with me, then you're wrong. I think this is a very, that would be great to say and a, a great thing if it was true. Um, but I think what it's, it, it has a wrong view of ourselves or the human condition. None of us have a perfect insight into the truth a reality of our lives. None of us has the keys to everything in progress. I mean, even some of us in our church community, we believe Jesus is the truth and the key to everything, but we oftentimes mi misrepresent Jesus and the things that we say and we do. Cancel culture also says that you aren't worth my time. It is too inconvenient to wait until you arrive at my high attained level of truth and reality, right? <laughs> I can't spend time to help and guide you with instruction. And so what happens is these people um, just attack each other and there's no space for growth and development, which leads me to my last point. Cancel culture says that you will never be at my level. And so instead of spending time with you, instead of walking with you, you're banished from my sight. <laughs> this town ain't big enough for the two of us. And there is no hope for your redemption. You won't be able to experience the type of peace and flourishing that I have because I have this level of truth that you'll never gain in this life. Cancel culture is, a, is a, a prominent theme that we see in the public square, but it is so hurtful, painful, and destructive 
towards what we believe God has called us to in relationship. If this was the standard for friendship, then all of us would be extremely lonely because <laughs> no one would want to put up with us and our baggage and our, and our junk in order to see us grow and develop. And I am really afraid for this generation of woke people to become parents because I'm going to tell you what, your kids will not be at your level of truth and reality for a, maybe never for a very long time. Instead, we're called to love and commit to those people who are maybe different from us. I think of the biblical standard that we find in Colossians chapter 3 that says, set your minds on things above. How can we do this? How can we set our minds on thing abo- things above when we are overcome with worry and stress, especially present in the last six months in this season, as many of you have lost employment, um, have found confusion around schooling for your kids and have to stay at home. I mean, all of the problems and worry that enter into this moment. We grieve the people that we've lost in this season or the things that we used to be able to do but are now confined to our homes that we can't do. I'm thinking of just talking to Kurt this morning about going to the zoo and how crazy it is now to enjoy that time with family. Uh, It's different, so we grieve those things. We strain under the toil of our daily labors. We feel guilt because of our sin and fallen condition. And meanwhile, we are assaulted by the evil one in our flesh and this world. I mean, how could we ever keep our minds on the things above when all of these issues and problems and external things happen around us? I think the way of Jesus has an answer for us. I think the way of Jesus has a profound imperative or command for us to live into in order for us to attain that ideal, that biblical truth to keep our eyes fixed on heaven. See, one of the most powerful things to experience, and I, and I know they're all, there are examples that we can uh, just think about and dwell on. That there are the, one of the most powerful things that we experience is participating in a community of belonging where we find freedom to be who we are, to be authentic with what we're struggling with and what we believe and what we think, where we find freedom to be who we are and a place to be loved where we can grow and develop and become more like Jesus together. That is, honestly, in my life, looking back, one of the most profound things. Um, looking at like my parents and family and my friendships and my community uh, of, of fellow believers at this church and in our city who love me not because of who I'm going to become or who I will be, but who I am right now with all of my failings, with all of my sin, with all of my um, just deception about myself and the world. That is the most powerful thing to experience And this is what we believe is found in the church, what Jesus desires for us to live into in church. So what would this look like? What are the possibilities for this way of life? Well, I think Galatians has a beautiful description of this for us this morning. So we're actually going to start in chapter 5, verse 25, and read through a few verses in chapter 6. Why don't you join me as we do that? Starting in, in verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit... Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. What a wonderful description of what community can look like. There are a few things that I want to highlight in this passage as we move along. Um, What are we to do as a community? Who is to do it? And how is it to be done? So let's, let's talk about what we're supposed to do in community. The most clear description we get from Paul is this, bear with one another. And what Paul assumes in this idea is that we live in a sinful community. I know, I know this is going to be crazy for you to hear, but the person sitting to your left or to your right is a sinner in need of Jesus. Amen? You maybe look at them with a weird stare right now. But also remember that you yourself are either to their left or right and are considered a sinner as well. <laughs> so be careful with how sternly you look at them across the room. Right? The idea here is that we live in a sinful community where we struggle with evil behavior and habits. 
One of, the, one of my favorite books is by an author, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a follower of Jesus, a pastor in Nazi Germany who gave his life um, at the hands of, of the Nazis in order to, to live and develop a church that was countercultural or against the racist claims of Nazism. He writes this book called Life Together, and what he does is I love how he displays, and he wants us to get through the illusion of community, because many of us, maybe it's just us young people, when we think of community, we think of like long wooden tables and felt hats and like a potluck dinner that a, a chef from a three-star, Michelin three-star restaurant made for us, right? We just think everyone's laughing and smiling, and that's what community should be like, but the reality is community is hard. It is a deep commitment that each of us have to be willing to give to sacrifice ourselves, our time, our finances in order to live in community with one another. Uh, so uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it this way, when the morning mists of the dreams vanish, then dawns that bright day of Christian fellowship. The idea like we have to break through this mist of community or this ideal of community that we think it's going to be like and actually commit ourselves to the dirty, the mundane, the ordinary, the hard work of loving someone who is really different from you. This is the first thing Paul assumes in this passage in Galatians, is that you will live into a sinful community. There will be sin among you. And what love is practically, what it means to bear one another's burdens, is to be willing to be inconvenienced by the sin of your brother or your sister. This is not a perfect place. And so the first idea that Paul gives us is that we have to bear one another's burdens and that, that burden being sin or our rebellion that we have in our lives. This underscores this true ideal that you will live with people who are wrong, who are sinful, who are hurtful, who will bite you when they can, but those are the people that God is calling you to love. The apostle gives us this instruction and he tells us to bear those burdens with one another. We need to carry those burdens when someone sins against you, to walk with them, to hopefully restore them. And burdens can also be those things that we carry outside of sin. When we think of like guilt of something we've done wrong or worry or sorrow and anxiety and all the other similar loads, Jesus is inviting you to bear that burden with someone, to walk closely with someone. So that's what we are to do. We are to bear one another's burdens. But who is to do it? I love how Paul uses this description, especially in verses 25 and 26. See, the person who's supposed to bear those burdens is someone who lives by the Spirit, who is not conceited or provoking or envying, but someone who is walking in step with the Spirit. Think of the descriptions just a few verses before and the fruit of the Spirit. This person who is to walk and share your burden is someone who is of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He tells us that we, the spiritual people, the ones who are walking with the Spirit, are the ones that are supposed to behave in love towards one another and to bear each other's burdens. What attitude or perspective, how is this supposed to be done? I think Paul captures this in one word. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Gentleness. That is how you are supposed to walk with someone next to you. I think oftentimes we are overcome with the, the great ideal of putting someone else down so that we feel good about ourselves. And so when someone sins next to you, when someone breaks a, a law from Scripture, when someone acts in a way that doesn't reveal Jesus, we tend to pounce on those people, but yet God is asking us through Paul to respond to people with gentleness. I love how Martin Luther describes it. Therefore, that we as Christians must have strong shoulders and mighty bones. What a description. That we are, as followers of Jesus, supposed to bear one another's burdens, oftentimes being the dirty, evil burden of sin. That we are to do it because we've been called to walk with the Spirit and to reveal ourselves as gentle towards one another. What is the goal of bearing these burdens? The goal of our relationships in community is to bring restoration. As Paul talks about it in um, verse 3, if anyone thinks they're something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Um, sorry, I missed the verse. <laughs> uh, verse 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And this idea is that we would walk with each other in these intentional relationships to put in order each other's lives in order that we might walk with Jesus and find peace and restoration. 
The word used in this passage to describe to put in order or to restore someone is the same word used in the Greek for a medical term in the way of like setting a fractured or dislocated bone. And I love the imagery being used to describe this, that we are to restore one another as a, a broken bone. I mean, not only to set the bone and to cast it, but to walk with that person until that limb is healed. Addressing those who are restored, we must envision this idea that we would be people who restore each other out of problems, out of sin, that we would carry this responsibility together and that we would help that person until they are free of the entanglement. I think a better description of our view of community is found in this character in Greek mythology. His name is Sisyphus. I have a picture of it because I think the picture is powerful. In this picture, this man is carrying this big rock up a mountain. Uh, In the Greek mythology, Sisyphus was being punished because he tried to cheat death. And so he is left for eternity to carry this rock up by himself, this mountain. And when he gets to the top, the rock tumbles down to the bottom and he has to go back and start it all over again. I think this is what we view our lives really being. And some people try to do this. They try to be Sisyphus and carry the burden by themselves. They think it's a sign of fortitude that we wouldn't bother other people with our burdens. And I certainly think this idea is brave for you to think that you could carry your own burdens without um, inconveniencing someone next to you. But this is not a Christian idea. If you're living this way, then you're not living in the way that God desires you to, to follow. We give a Christianese answers like, God, I cast my burdens on God and God alone. And that is a truth, and that is something we hold on to, and that's something we should do, as, as 1 Peter 5 would say, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares. For you. We have a God who cares for you. Uh, we have a Jesus who carried the same burdens you carry of grief, depression, loss, and he knows what you're struggling with, as the, he, the author of Hebrews would explain. We even think of Psalm 68, Praise be to the Lord God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. We believe this, that God loves you, and you should be casting all your cares on God. But what we forget is sometimes God, not sometimes, most of the time, I think, God uses a brother or a sister in community to explain and describe that love and compassion from God onto you. I think of 2 Corinthians. Paul was describing this moment that he had he was harassed. He had no rest, as this passage in 2 Corinthians says. But he, he describes it in this way in verse 6. But God, who comforts the downcast, and Paul would have needed great comfort as he'd been stoned, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been tossed in jail and, and hunted. Um, he needed that comfort. In, cha- in verse 6, though, he says, But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Think about that for a second. God used the coming of Titus to be a messenger of good news to Paul, to bring comfort and compassion. And oftentimes, God is looking to use someone to your left and to your right, to in your community, to bring you peace that you so long for. God wants to bring you that love by one another. I have two thoughts here that I want to leave us with. The first is this. Many of us show up to a church community And we feel shameful because of the things that we've done in our lives and we never let anyone in. I think what we need is more humility. There's way too much pride in us not to let others love us in certain ways. We come in, we we feel dirty, we feel shameful. And if that's you this morning, I want to invite you and I want to encourage you to say there's nothing you could say or do that would lead us to kick, you, uh, to, to kick you to the curb. Your junk is something we want to bear with you. The other thing is this. Many of you in this community are living with no inconvenience. You're thinking to yourselves, uh, is there, has there been someone who's reached out to you for help? Is there someone who has, has confessed to you? Is there someone around you that is struggling? Uh, if you say no, then what I, I have to admit or confess to you is that maybe you're not living in relationships that God has designed for you to live in. Because love is proactive. The very nature of love is to be inconvenienced. And if you're not being inconvenienced, then you're not loving in the right way. Instead, Jesus is inviting you, if you feel shameful, to confess your sins to one another to admit that you do not have it all together and you cannot do this alone. And secondly, that we would be an authentic people who know one another. 
And we, won't, and we will be willing to be weighed down by your junk and brokenness in order to see you restored in the view of the church and before God. Paul describes this type of behavior as fulfilling the law, that every act of compassion and self-sacrifice on behalf of your brother or sister is a practical means of displaying the love of Christ and fulfilling the commands of Scripture and the law. Many of us think, what is, how do we fulfill the law? Is it by knowing intellectually all the theologies and Scriptures found in the, in the New Testament or Old Testament? That's good, but that's not it. If you want to live powerfully in the way of Jesus, then it's revealed in your love for one another. And that we would embody the, the behavior, the actions of Jesus and bear one another's burdens. One of the most powerful stories Jesus used to illustrate this is the Good Samaritan. If you're unfamiliar with this story, Jesus uses a provocative character, a Samaritan. Um, someone the Jews hated or these, these people Jesus was teaching to, they hated Um, there's a man on the side of the road who's been beaten, who's been robbed, and who's an an inch from death. And clergy and church leaders and religious leaders pass by him on the other side. But this hated character, the Samaritan, stops and, and, and approaches this person in gentleness and does whatever he can. He gives up money and pays for a place to stay. He um, bandages the wounds and does everything he can to help and aid this person on the side of the road. And I think that's the, the type of life, the type of burden God is inviting us to live into, that we would be inconvenienced, that we would move through love and compassion by means of gentleness to those in our community who are hurting, whether financially or spiritually Um, whether are struggling with depression and anxiety, that we would be a people who are proactive in our approach to bear their burden together and love them. I think a powerful thing for us to do in this view to bring on more humility is recognizing our own burdens that we've put on Jesus. Think of that song we just sang, How Great Thou Art. There's a, a, a line in there that says, And when I think that God, his son not sparing, Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. That is the actions that Jesus has moved towards you. That he bore your burden of sin and has brought you access to his forgiveness and redemption um, by the very means of the cross. That we would again be that type of people who embody the behavior and nature of Jesus and to gladly bear each other's burdens so that we would see people come to life and healing and forgiveness and peace in our community. I wanted to close with a, a provocative picture. Um, there's, this, there's this guy named Daryl Davis, and I heard his interview on NPR. Um, he has a unique hobby. He is someone who befriends members of the KKK, and tries to convert them out of the Klan. I have a a first picture. He's standing next to someone at a burning cross. Now, this is a stark picture, stark contrast. This man, who is an African-American, befriends members of the KKK, and he loves on them, and he's identified the image of God on them, and he desires to convert their hate to love. And Daryl Davis has been motivated by the message of Jesus. He's a follower of, of Jesus. And he wants to display compassion and gentleness in a way that I have never heard of or seen before. Now, if we were living with our cancel culture, what cancel culture would say is Daryl Davis should never talk to someone like that again. Those people are lost and should never be saved. There's no path of redemption for those people because they are too far gone. And yet what the message of Jesus says is there's no one too far gone. Daryl Davis, the second picture, has collected over 200 capes and robes from members of the KKK of people who have left the Klan because of their relationship with him. And they give him their robes as kind of this this mark or this honoring of him. And he's got a, a closet full of these robes and hoods. And what a beautiful picture of what it's what this scripture is describing as someone who bears our burdens together. That we would understand that there is no one too far gone. There is no one in our community who is uh, his, his too far from the path of redemption. And instead, we as followers of Jesus are called to be authentic, to know each other at a deep level, to confess our sins to one another and to, to, to honestly say that we are not perfect and we need help. And instead of being like Sisyphus, we're going to be like a, a band of community carrying that rock up the mountain together.
And that is a community that I want to be a part of. And that's a community that I think brings profound freedom um, for us to grow and develop in compassion as we become more like Jesus today. And I think that's a, a message that I think or a hope that our community would become, that we would be more like Daryl Davis instead of cancel culture. And we would be a people who say, regardless of what you've done, we believe Jesus can heal you too. Would you just uh, and, and pray with me as we close and get ready to sing a few more songs together? Lord, we pray a blessing over this church community. Um, Lord, we pray that you would give us patience in moments that are hard to deal with one another's brokenness and sin. Lord, that in this season, we would be humble enough to confess that we need help and humble enough to receive the love of our neighbors. Lord, I just pray a blessing over this church and ask that you'd continue to create in us a desire for compassion and love for those around us. And ultimately, we would be a community that, in a real sense, bears the burdens of one another. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us this Sunday. It's been a wonderful time of worship together, and I just pray that the words of God as delivered to this morning would, would really penetrate your heart. You would be able to live like the people God has called you to be this week. Just want to remind you that next week we begin our very first in-person worship time, next Sunday, November the 1st, right here at our Babel Avenue campus. But you need to sign up for it. Space is limited. So please go online. Each week you'll have to sign up because we only have a limited number of spaces available. We would love to see you next week right here to worship with us. I want to close with some words from Hebrews chapter 13. I think these are powerful and encouraging words today. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray this week you'll have a wonderful week living as the people of God in the world today, encouraging one another, upholding one another's burdens, and being the body of Christ.